Welcome to this podcast and making me thirsty number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This is episode 61. Today's guest is a veteran star of television and film. He's currently the director of artistic outreach at East Tennessee State University. His career has spanned six decades. You know him from hundreds of television shows and films, including Alice, Cheers, Rocky Five, Home Improvement. And of course, he played Sid Farkas in the season five classic, The Sniffing Accountant, and the season six classic, The Doorman of Seinfeld. Please welcome Patrick Cronin. Thanks, Patrick, for joining us. Thank you. <clears throat> delighted, delighted. Good to yeah. see you. Patrick, this is uh, this is such a treat for us. Sid Farkas is one of our favorite characters, hands down, of the whole series. So take us back, uh, 1993, The Sniffing okay. Account, season five. Um, you know, you know the episode. How the whole how the whole role come about? I know you know. Tony just mentioned he did a lot of work with Cheers, uh, obviously Home Improvement. Um, how how the whole Seinfeld role come about? Was there an audition? Yeah, oh gosh, yes. Um, and, and it's exciting, you know. I uh, spent the last uh, twenty years uh, teaching at East Tennessee State, and I did some coaching in LA too. Uh, it's just. Um, if you're not in the biz, I mean, it, the process is grueling. And uh, and so, uh, yes, there was a, an audition. I was very fortunate. Um, Meg Lieberman and Bobby Hirschfeld were the casting for Seinfeld. And if you're, a, you know, what I consider, you know, one of those character actors where people sort of know you, you know, and they think you went to high school in Cleveland, and insisted you did when you say, no, I didn't. But, you know, and then for a long time, I looked like Ned Beatty. Yeah, we, we, yeah my, we could see that for sure. Yeah, yeah. you know, when the hair was blood, and, you know, back in Deliverance Day, I'd be at a bus stop and somebody would go, Deliverance changed my life. I said, Christ, what kind of life do you have? <laughs> and so... <laughs> It asked for an autograph. Eventually, I just got tired of saying, I'm not Ned Beatty. I'm really somebody, you know. So I just signed it. So you have to check all autographs. That's there are a lot great. of Beatties out there that are, are not valid. Anyway, Meg Lieberman, who's, that was an interesting part of the process. I was married, Lord Rester, to an actor for 23 years, uh, Beatrice Colin, who was on Barney Miller, and she was on Wonder Woman. She was at a candy she was on Happy Days. It was March of the Car Hop. And the person who cast Happy Days was Meg Lieberman's mother. Oh, wow. Wow. So, and that was Beatrice's first big gig. So when I moved to L.A. in 76, and I met Betsy, and we got married, we used to go to, like, parties. Frank Lieberman was a major press agent. He was Meg's dad. And he was also Bob Hope's PR man. So this is a funny story. I'm sorry, I'm off the track. No, no, it's all good. I mean, Bob, Frank used to have these parties. They lived in Beverly Hills. They had money. They weren't super rich, but they were, you know, showbiz kind of icony types. And uh, he, Frank liked me a lot when his wife, Lord Rest, when Pat died, um, he used to, and we used to go out and have lunch at Musso and Frank's. Anybody who's anybody goes to Musso and Frank's. And uh, I loved it there. And so um, he'd have these parties at Christmas and you'd go and it, like Frank Sinatra, Bob Hope. It was just kind of silly, really. Wow. And um, I was there and I'd be there, you know, sort of just oogling people. And oh, look at that. Oh my goodness, it's Anne Margaret. And uh, so this young lady was there and uh, she was an actor like me. She was kind of hustling, trying to make it. And we started talking. We had a lot of mutual friends. And the next thing you know, her manager came up and he said, I busted my ass to get you invited here. Don't talk to an actor. He's not going to do anything for you. <laughs> so, so that was that was the end of that. Anyway, for Seinfeld, I was lucky. I never had a powerful agent. Um, I had good agents, but not the kind that called, you know, Steven Bochco or Steven Spielberg or any of the Stevens. They <laughs> you in. And so you're always on the hustle, you know, what can I get in for? And of course, 
uh, CAA changed the whole way things are marketed. In other words, I want Jerry Seinfeld in a series and I'm represented by William Morris or CAA or anybody will say, yes, you can have Jerry, but the next five roles are going to be cast by us. And that okay. happened prior to you know CAA. Michael Ovitz created that kind of deal process. So then it became very hard if you weren't with a power agent to get in for roles like Sid Farkas. They were sort of handed to people. Mm, interesting. I was lucky, as I say, I had a group of casting directors who liked me and Meg was one. So I go in and uh, for the, I had to audition for both parts. They didn't just bring me in the second time. They weren't quite sure they wanted to continue with Sid. Oh, really interesting. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a hottest show on television. Yeah, sure, fair. But I mean, sure, hottest but show. I mean, the, the day we tape the, the episode is your is your business. I mean, they got to well, bring it you back. Know, and the, you're a friend this, of Frank's. The the sniffing accountant. Um, the day we taped, uh, like Woody Allen was there. I mean, the audience was not the same. I did. I was a regular on Home Improvement, which I also loved, and Tim was great to work with. Sure. But the audience for Home Improvement were all from Indiana. <laughs> the, audience, the audience for Seinfeld, that was the thing about doing Seinfeld. Certain shows are industry driven. It doesn't matter whether Indiana likes the show or it doesn't like the show. I mean, Seinfeld was not a hit for the first two years. Right. But the people who mattered liked it. <laughs> Same with 30 something. I mean, I never did that show, but I had friends on that show. Melody Mehron was a friend of mine and still is a good friend. And uh, five people liked that show. And so it didn't matter what the ratings were. I mean, the ratings for 30 something were never good. But if the five people who matter like it, Staying it doesn't, there, yeah. doesn't yeah. matter what the hell anybody else says. Right. So I went in to read for the sniffing accountant. and. Um, they had like 10, you would know them all. I mean, they all have specials on Comedy Channel and you know, they all have their own touring acts. And so I'm sitting, when you audition in Los Angeles, a nightmare, you're in a room that you know cost $42. I mean, and, and it's got 40 people in it when the fire code says tw you know, 20 max. And you're sitting out in the ante room. And of course, you hear everything that's going on before you go in. So now 10 guys have just gone in who could buy and sell you career-wise. And the place is ripping apart. I mean, ripping apart with laughter. So I go in <laughs> to read. And of course, you're reading with either Meg Lieberman or, or Bobby Hirschfeld. You're reading with you know one of the casting people or a, one of their assistants. So I go in and he said, and uh, Costanza says, um, I've always been interested in brassiers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> getting it not from him. And he, he and I, by the way, were friends in New York. We were both sage junkies. And um, so uh, anyway, I've got this young woman, I think actually not Meg or uh, Bobby. And she says, I've always liked brassiers. You know, there's nothing, you're not getting anything. So now you have to pretend you're hearing, you know, somebody to saying it right. Right. So I said, well, you can see it in the way you look at them or whatever the hell that line was. And he says, yes. So, and, so. and then I hire him and he says, you have quite a remarkable pension for brassiers. <laughs> I'll see you at nine o'clock. And he says, I'll be here at eight. So I'm, guys have been in before me, tearing the place apart. And all of a sudden I come in and I'm not a comic. I don't do stand up. That's not my thing. But for me, Sid Farkas was a real guy. Right, right. He was Business a guy man. who liked Brazier's in a non sexual way. Right. No sexual connotation for him at all. And so when he said, you have a remarkable pension for brassiers, that's just like saying, you really know what a good fishing rod looks like. Right, <laughs> right. So 
I start auditioning with this nice young lady and then, and the place goes silent. It's like, I, I thought I'm going to have to burn my SAG card in, you know, Westwood. So anyway, I do the whole scene and nothing. I mean, the place had been ripping apart before I got in there. Right. And then in this silence, Larry David says, that was very funny. <laughs> so Larry did. So was was Jer was Jerry there as well? Or just Larry? Oh my God! Yes. Yeah, because they wrote that episode. That the Oh, episode. Well, yeah, Larry and Larry and Jerry wrote it, wrote it. Yeah. Oh my God! And Larry, you know, the word genius gets tossed around rather. Right. I met, well, off the top of my head, two that I can think of: Larry David, and and. Um, James Burroughs on Cheers, yeah, yeah. You had you were on Cheers, right? Yeah, episode, I mean, yeah. I I knew his father in New York, Abe, the director, who did Guys and Dolls and stuff. Oh, and, wow. uh, when I was a you know do, trying to make it as an actor, as theater actor, and uh, James just had a sense of comedy that was amazing, and so was Larry David. Larry both both of them were geniuses when it came to the work of the ensemble. It was really like being at the Guthrie or arena stage. It wasn't like, I mean, I liked, you know, Home Improvement and I liked Dallas and, and All in the Family. I mean, I did a lot of the cosmic shows, but most of those, if they were good, were fun. But on Seinfeld and on Cheers, you, you sensed that this was art. Right. <laughs> Getting pretentious about it. But it was the difference, you know, you felt more like you were doing Lear or Macbeth rather than Saved by the Bell, which most of it. So, I mean, <laughs> right. And, and you know, a lot of that, I mean, we Steving account, by the way, before, you know, we ranked every episode of Seinfeld when we started our podcast and it landed number 12 for us. So obviously we think very highly of, of the episode and a lot of it has to do with your your scene with George, um, yeah. the one you just referenced in your um, in your uh your audition so now right. you're actually on the set with jason and whom it sounds like you knew from from new york i knew briefly from, in new york and when he was doing york. forum yep and, <clears> for um, which you want to tell me you know for us george behind a desk is seinfeld like that's that's when he's talking to someone else <laughs> that person behind a desk and he's doing his thing like you mentioned like loving brassiers and everything else i mean that scene just is it's incredible scene the way you deliver like you just said you deliver it straight and that's what gets the laugh and that's, it's, you yeah, know that's, that's how you yes. did it so you know, any, any, anything about that, ep that, you know, shooting that scene that you can, you can maybe, if you recall from that long ago, that just. Well, happened. actually I have much stronger memories. I mean, I love that. And, right. uh, you know, but it occurred, it was part of a string of shows for Seinfeld where George got hired and fired. Hmm. Uh, and so it felt a bit of a piece with other shows. Um, and uh, whereas the brazier with the bro and the man's ear, right? We were really in in fresh territory. Sure. And, and that's uh, what Frank. That's what Frank and and Kramer. I mean, you did see. Yes. Yeah. With um. And and so, uh, oh, I was starting to tell before we went live. Um, yeah, yeah. On that episode, when we were doing the scene, and I have it on my promo reel, um, because it's just iconically good for me to to be in really and and to see it and so uh when he said uh when uh, what's his name says uh well uh, how, what do you see in the back hooks velcro and he says well velcro when uh, you're getting intimate with a woman you don't want her fumbling and stumbling back there <laughs> and so we all started to laugh you know which seemed right and that was in rehearsal but when we did it live and this is something as an actor as a guest actor you just never do but i was on a roll and i did something i shouldn't have done and we're in the laughter i just had this thought of what a great time sid might have had one night and i had lived summer nights <laughs> watch the scene if you watch it i mean i watch it a lot I sit, sit, I'm calling you Sid, uh, Mr. Vargas. I mean that line, yeah. Talk about iconic, and and talk about you, you said you took a risk, but 
we talk to a lot of guest stars and the sense we get from Larry and Jerry is how inviting they are and how, how selfless they are yeah. and, and how they give guest stars kind of uh, let them shine. And you certainly did that episode, but yeah, the, the, the chemistry you had with, well, what's incredible is you, incredible chemistry with George is, is incredible. And then the Kramer Frank and stuff was just to your point, iconic. Um, can you any uh, any stories about Jerry Stiller that that are uh, top of mind for well, you? I also knew Jerry in New York. I was friends with his wife Ann Mira. Okay, yeah, yeah. you in New York? We're really Patrick? dealing all over the place, Patrick. Huh? Well, when I was in New York trying to make it, um, and it's funny, you, you know, you, I'm eighty, so if you're an actor, so let's go back uh, oh, 50 years. <laughs> um, you. you <laughs> I was trying to make it as I was a theater trained actor. I studied with Richard Schechner, who did Dionysus in 69. So we were rehearsing in the nude in the dark and uh, other things. And then I go to New York and try to do important work. And the next thing you know, I'm in Texas doing Born Yesterday with Betty Grable. And when I started teaching, I I figured they wouldn't know who Betty Grable was. I was right. She was, of course, the number one star in America for. 20 years, made more money than anybody, but nobody knows who she is. And, and it's sort of, that's weird in a way. And then I, after she died of throat cancer, I was touring with Dorothy L'Amour, who was her best friend and who had been on the Bob Hope, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> movies, uh, the road to road movies. And then I was out with Alan Seuss, who by the way, was the funniest man I've ever met, who was on Laughing, played the gal, the kitty's pal. And uh, anyway, I toured for two or three years. And every time I tried to make it in New York, which is where I knew Jerry Stiller and where I knew uh, Jason, I couldn't get a New York gig. <laughs> but I was making $450 a week supporting 1940s movie stars in Texas and Florida. And uh, But I finally just said, you know, this isn't going to work for me. So actually what did it, I was in Philly, which is my home. And this guy came up to me in a restaurant. I was doing a play in Philly, and I forgot what. He came up in the restaurant. He said, God, you were good last night. I said, thank you. Thank you very much. He said, you're better than Richard Burton. I said, God, why are we doing bullshit, really? Why, why are we doing that? And then all of a sudden, it dawned on me, this guy is a Philly doctor or a Philly lawyer. And for his life to have meaning, I have to be better than Richard Burton. And, <laughs> and I thought... I got to get out of here because I don't want to be his excuse for being in Philly. And I want to see if I can compete with the big boys. New York hadn't worked. And so I went to LA. I bought a one way ticket. And wow. I had two people in LA. I knew Alan Seuss, whom I had toured with. And I knew Lloyd Schwartz. And that's another interesting story. His father created the Brady Bunch and Gilligan. yeah, Gilligan's Island, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so somebody said to me the other day, you know, some friend of mine's daughter just died. And somebody said, you know, people in your life matter. And I said, you know, and some do. And I said, yes, I wouldn't have the life I have if it weren't for Sherwood Schwartz and his son Lloyd and Alan Seuss. And the two of them really made my life possible in L.A. And people are always, un not always, some people are unclear as to who they owe things to. Nobody gets anywhere on their own. And uh, so anyway, it uh, the ad lib on, on Seinfeld to draw it back to that was Summer Nights. And, and I was afraid of, since it was an ad lib, uh, uh, Kramer went, that's very funny. If you watch him in the scene, right. he, he wasn't expecting it. Right. And he just said, that's very funny. <laughs> and I thought, oh, shit, they're going to cut the scene. It was going great. And it's going to be my fault. And <laughs> you, know, you, you know what's exactly. interesting about that scene as well, Patrick, is you you bring back the line, but it's it's slight little twist. You probably know it. It's obviously the old, uh, barring any unforeseen incident, you say, <laughs> incident, you say incident to George. But with Frank and Kramer, you say, barring any unforeseen developments. Were yes. you aware? Were you aware of the slight change there? Or yes, I love that. Yes. No, that was. I mean, 
that was the other thing about ad living. First of all, ad living in a show is is tricky. Uh, certainly in live, you know. Right. It in rehearsal, if you're comfortable, like the first home improvement I did, they had written a very funny script, in which um, Tim and I were picking out car colors, and what they wanted was two women in Bloomingdale's fighting over a handbag. I mean, that's what they wanted. And that's what they'd sort of written. But while Tim is a brilliant comic and a good actor in, in that sort of thing, is the scene was getting sort of two gay guys arguing and it was not. <laughs> and so I could see Tim getting miserable and I thought, I'm going to get fired. Now, I did over 200 television shows in 25 years. I was never fired. There was a guy, actually, a guy fired on uh, the Bro of the Man's Ear episode. Really? Oh, really? Yeah. But let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. Um, but anyway, so I'm doing this scene with Tim where I'm going, you know, the, the front of the car could be in mauve. And he says, well, what about Tope? And I go, Tope, Tope, Tope. And so anyway, I did something I probably shouldn't have done, but I thought, well, they're, they're going to fire me or they're going to can this episode. And so I said, uh, would you folks mind if Tim and I sort of ad lib this scene for a minute? I think if you just let Tim and I ad lib this, you might find that we'll find an energy <laughs> that you're looking for. Right. And subtext, I won't get fired. Right. <laughs> or Tim. So we did. We started ad libbing different colors for the car in different ways. And it was funny because have an overlay of two women. It, it, it was Tim and myself. And so they wrote it. They rewrote the scene based on the ad libs we did. But that's rare. You just don't you don't want to do that. You, Very you know. cool. Yeah, I mean. So, Speaking, of, you know, just to get back to Seinfeld for a minute yeah, too, about, about about that is is interesting because you mentioned so season five sniffing account. You know, we rank it twelve, like I said, all the time. Your your other episode, the doorman, is our favorite from season six. Um, and again, it has a lot to do with your scene. But it sounds like you had to audition to come back for that episode. You said, yeah, they think that, they, I think they, they weren't entirely. That, I think they weren't entirely sure whether they were going to go to the same. The episode was based on Larry David's having sold Brazier's one summer. Oh, yeah. Tell, tell us that story. You were starting to tell <laughs> yeah, that story. I mean, did, that's did he, it. I mean, did he give you the background on that himself? Uh, I learned it in rehearsal. Yeah, he actually okay. at one point said, yeah, sold Brazier's in a, in a department store. <laughs> it makes no <laughs> sense. Right. And, and uh, But that's where they got the idea. So I would think they weren't sure whether they were going to go back to where George had been fired and, you know, or whether they were going to get somebody in a department store. I mean, they weren't sure. So they, they brought me in? back. Yeah. And they, yeah. And they had 10 other comics, all of whom have their own series now. And, you know, the, and again, the, the place is being torn apart with laughter. And then I went in and I, I think I'm a funny enough guy, but, I've also played Willie Loman four times and I've done oh, right, long right. days. I'm an actor. I mean, I'm not a bad one. You know, I'm not great, but I'm not a bad one. And I don't have to be somebody else or Richard Burton either. And so, <laughs> um, you know, it's it, finding the truth in, in comedy, you know, all the cliches, tragedy is easy, comedy is hard, is true. I mean, death of a salesman is difficult to do, but it's on a single note. Mm. When, find that note you know you play it out but in Seinfeld there are multiple levels of truth on all the episodes I mean that's what makes it so wonderful is it's yeah, that's a great point so Patrick were you that's uh point, yeah. I mean you're a great actor throughout the years were you a fan of the show like pr prior to joining did you have did you have any favorite episodes you mentioned like you, you knew you knew of Larry David and, and, and Jerry well, I didn't know them until I did the show, obviously, in, in what you say was 95. 93 um, was Sniffing Accountant. Sniffing Accountant, 93. Um, I, you know, it was a show I watched. Um, at first, 
to me, like a lot of people, it felt like a show about nothing. Right. You know, but I was, when I had the opportunity to audition, um, you know, people ask me, what did you, what, what's the highlight of your career in Los Angeles? And I was there from 1976 to 2000. And in that time, I did Star Trek TNG. God, that was, that was a wonderful uh, wow. episodes of Seinfeld. And I did, a, I was a regular on Alice. I recurred actually on 11 series. Um, I did five seasons, five series for Stephen Bochco, speaking of geniuses. Hmm. Uh, I did Hill Street Blues. I did uh, Law, LA Law, which was also a great show to work on. But of all of them, uh, the highlight of my looking back, you know, 20 years since I worked it, well, that's not true. I did Army Wives and Sabrina, Teenage Witch. Thank God I did Army Wives because I thought when I died, they were going to say, and his last show was Sabrina, Teenage Witch. <laughs> <laughs> not going to be a good exit. <laughs> so at least now they're safe. Well, he lived too long, but his last show was Army Wives. So that doesn't. But you, you have, you have embraced. Sid Farkas, right? I love Sid Farkas. Yeah, I, love I, just, I still love it. It's it's incredible to hear you before talking about you know finding the truth and, and things like that. I mean, any being a real actor, you get a role like that, and you just know straight to go with like, okay, this guy sells bras. That's what he does, and and you you nail it in the in the Costanza episode, and then you bring up you know this guy. He's talking to the fellas, they're talking about bras. Let's think about summer nights, and you throw the summer yeah. nights line. I, like you knew this guy, like and I it did. shows, yeah, and it shows. And I, that's I knew him. Yeah, I knew him, and <clears throat> people like that <clears throat> are never a joke, right? They're yeah, yeah. In their own mind, and and they have standing in the. I mean, I don't want to do a lot of Stanislavski here, but I mean, he had a wife and kids, and I mean, you know, I had a life for this guy. And when he went home, he, he was admired in the neighborhood. He cut his lawn. I mean, he did the things that people care about. And, and what you don't do is um, the, the trap for comics is they get a role like that and they want to make it funny. Right. And that's what was wrong with everybody who was reading before me. Right. They weren't yes. playing Sid Farkas. They, yeah, you know, Sid, they, uh, yeah, the guest stars do that often in Seinfeld that we talked about. Well, yeah, Sid... Yeah, Sid, Sid's a regular guy, and even you know, even the great Sid Farkas has someone he has to report to. And I love oh this. Scene. I love this oh. scene with Chris, Krista Miller, who kind of shuffle out of your office, and you know, oh. you're embarrassed. That was, God, that was yeah. Tell us, tell us a little bit about that scene. Well, what was great was uh, you know sitting there uh, and. Uh, you know, working with him on, on the bras and all of that was really wonderful. And and the kind of smugness that the two of us felt at the end of the scene, you know, well, you have a remarkable pension for me. <laughs> yeah. It's just a wonderful concept. And and then when he says with great, and I can see me standing up with real a feeling of authority, <laughs> we'll see you Monday at nine o'clock. I'll be there at eight. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the two of us just swelling right. with, with pride at this bravado, then, yeah. yeah, yeah, and this whole masculine nonsense. And then he goes out there, and of course, Elaine had told him, told George, that if he went up to a strange, beautiful girl and felt the sleeve of her blouse, right, <laughs> this was going to be a really great pickup moment. <laughs> and then he goes out and does that <laughs> it's classic it's and then she comes into my office and says who is this guy and he's gonna start working here on on monday well if he's here you're out and yes i'll say <laughs> and then i go after him and fire him yeah god that was fun i mean that was really when that's comedy you know you, what people don't understand about comedy, even subtle comedy like Seinfeld, is that it's always about the audience feeling superior to everybody they're watching. You don't do that with Lear or Death of a Salesman or any serious work, but with Seinfeld or Home Improve, any of the comedies, 
you're not the guy that's going to fall on the banana peel. The guy that's going to fall on the banana peel are those other idiots. Right. <laughs> All of a sudden, to reduce Sid Farkas, who was there, you'll be here at nine o'clock, you know, and he's firing the, in a second, drops the guy in a second. You know, that's funny. <laughs> That's what's funny. And that's why I love the audition. I didn't get a laugh from Jerry or Larry David, who were both laughing like crazy at the 10 other guys. But the difference was they were laughing at the material when the other guys were punching it up. When I went in, all of a sudden, it wasn't about the jokes. It was about Sid Farkas was now alive in the room. And all of a sudden, they didn't have to laugh at the material they knew was funny. Right. But they had a guy they could believe in. And that's why Larry said, you know, what seemed to me like a deadly silence, that's funny. And then Jerry, right behind him, said, yes, that's funny. That's the seal of approval right <laughs> there. Don't take any of this stuff lightly. <laughs> Right, exactly. I mean, they, they, that's what they go for every time is the funny, and and they want that. They saw it in you, which is which is great. Um, you've been on hundreds of sets, you know, uh, over several decades. Um, you were you spanned the the two seasons. So season five, the Stephen Accountant was Tom Sharon's last season on Seinfeld, the director, and yes. then uh, Andy Ackerman took over, and then you came aboard again in season six with Andy Ackerman. We yes. use that as a kind of defining moment of of our fandom of the show we're fans of the whole series but it kind of took a turn after sharon's left and then ultimately after larry david left but um i was curious i know it's again far back but is there, did you notice a difference between sharon's and ackerman i know ackerman's brilliant but was there anything that you could kind of point to that scene I, was there a sense at all where it was different well i think i'm going to say something that i don't know people aren't going to like maybe but that's right true i mean um The two directors I worked for on Seinfeld had no real authority. Larry David ran the show? Yeah, Larry David ran everything. If you cross Larry David, you were playing a banjo talking to a goose. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you were done. You know, I mean, and, and listen, you don't do 200 shows and recur on 11 series the way I did without understanding how the game is played. Right, right. You could tell, yeah, right away. Obviously. You're on the set two minutes and you go, and I'm nice to everybody. I used to tell my students, go through this world and when your name comes up, don't have people spit on the floor. Mm. Two people, I did Love Boat and um, I was there with Florence Henderson, whom sure. I had, and Florence and I were friends. And oh, great. That's awesome. Schwartz's. And uh, Florence at the mouth of a sailor. I mean, she'd make any sailor look bad. And she was pissing and moaning to me on the set of Love Boat about how uh, she couldn't get to play anything but Maria in Sound of Music, which she loathed. And, you know, because nobody would accept her in a role of a prostitute or, you know, something else. Right. And so um, Spelling came by, who ran the show, and, and, uh, he said, hi, Florence, and he didn't know who the hell I was. I was playing Hulk Hogan's manager on the episode. And so anyway, he comes by and he says, hi, Florence, hi there, and, you know, waving at me like I mattered. <laughs> and so uh, he says, uh, and I'm not going to say who this is because they're not significant and two, one of them's dead, but it's a, it was a husband and wife team. And I, I knew both of them in New York and both of them were despised. And so uh, anyway, uh, so Florence said to Spelling, who's, uh, who, who's on the love boat next week, uh, Aaron? He said, oh, so-and-so and so-and-so. Three people walked past and literally spit on the floor. One writer, one a, a producer, and, and one a food service person. I mean, so I tell my students, you don't want that. I mean, yes, you can annoy anybody. <clears throat> but if you go through a career and everybody who knows you don't doesn't like you, you know this is this is not good. I I got my second big break in L.A. 
when I did All in the Family. I was doing a workshop trying to get seen by people. And there was this kid on the set, on, on backstage doing props, big kind of gangly kid, heavy. And uh, everybody was ignoring him. And I don't know, I felt sorry for him. Nobody was talking to him or anything. And I was just, you know, trying to get seen. So I struck up a concert. He and I both liked the horses. So we both started talking about a Hollywood Park, which was then a racetrack. And uh, so we had a great time. He loved the horses. I didn't have to talk to him about Sart. I mean, we were talking about who's going to win the next race. So a week later, I get a call. I don't have an agent. And it's um, Norman Lear's office. And the woman says, this is Norman Lear's office. And I'm thinking, yeah, and I'm, you know, Rocky, still, you know, whatever. <laughs> no, it really is. We're, we're Norman Lear. And uh, there's this kid who's working with you on a show you're doing in Santa Monica. I said, oh, yeah. Yeah, well, his parents work for Norman. They're producing what's happening. Oh, wow. wow. So he's an 18 year old kid I was nice to. He went back to his parents and said, this guy I'm working with and the show is really funny. I got here from New York. Um, you guys should see him. So I went to Norman and said, there's a guy, new actor from New York and we should have met. So I came in, I auditioned and got uh, that guest shot on All in the Family, which really sort of made my start, got it rolling. So wow. great to hear those That's stories. Funny. Somebody always helps, but you gotta be nice to people. Right. That's it. You 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 never know who you're talking to and who who they may know, et cetera. So that's and, uh, and just do it because it's the right thing to do. Well, yeah, that too. It's, but you know, yeah. <laughs> but it can also benefit you. So um what I I'm always interested about just sorry, get but get back to Seinfeld. The Snippet sure. Account was a just a magnificent show. Were were you on set for all the other scenes? Did you interact? I mean, it was yes. a jam packed. It was a jam packed show. I mean, um, any kind of fun nuggets? I know you worked with, specifically with George and Krista Miller, but have any interactions with um, you know Julia, well, Kramer, Jerry? You, I mean, I knew then I was working on a legendary show. I knew by that point, this right? Was not just another sitcom. Did right. plenty of those, but um, so I watched, you know, and uh, and Jerry Stiller was was uh, really fun to watch because you know we're the same age bracket, and he had a college girl with him that helped him learn lines. I mean, he was really, you know, <laughs> all age. I mean, he's older than I and I'm last deceased now, but uh, hmm. he was spending a lot of time, you know, just making sure he had those lines. And, uh, but watching Elaine was, you know, the thing about Seinfeld is Jerry never won an Emmy. The other people all did, all won acting Emmys at some point. Actually, Jason didn't, surprisingly. Oh, yes, Jason didn't, did he? He was nominated like 100 But Jerry times. never did. That Jerry was, never did. No, no, he wasn't even nominated. Uh, yes. I don't think Jerry was even nominated. The thing about Jerry, Jerry was the Mary Tyler Moore of that show. You don't have a successful comedy without Mary Tyler Moore, which is why none of the spinoffs, except for Rhoda, ever worked off of Mary Tyler Moore because you took the funny person, like Kramer, you couldn't do a series around Kramer because you can't have the lead person be insane. The lead person has to be Jerry <laughs> Seinfeld. Right. He's got a job, can afford his apartment, and everybody else then can be as nuts as they want to be. And I don't know why producers don't learn this. You cannot have a show that doesn't have Mary Tyler Moore because it won't work without that sensible rock around which we can all work and then everybody else. But watching Elaine was probably as evidenced by her going on. She was clearly the most gifted of the stars in that sense. I mean, as far as broad range. I mean, she could be a leading lady. She could be funny. She could, I mean, she had a great range, tremendous range. And that was wonderful to watch. Yeah. I don't think that's a great point. I don't think she gets the, the due credit she deserves. And I'm just curious, have we ever, I mean, I was just watching the, the episode of the doorman earlier and uh, you know, Estelle comes in to pick up Frank and 
she claims she's going out on a date with Sid Farkas. Can you can you tell us where you guys planned on going that night? Um, <laughs> that's one of those stories. What the hell, eighty? What do I care? Uh, <laughs> we were supposed to do like a ten episode riff on me dating her. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Really? See, yeah. See. But what happens here in life is when I got to LA in 76, what they called paying actors top of the show. See, prior to that, shows like Gunsmoke and, and Have Gun Will Travel. Dollars. And then they had a guest star and they paid him 10,000 or her 10,000 for the episode. And um, it says my connection is unstable. So, yeah, your audio went out for a second there, but okay. I think it's okay now. Yeah, we're all right. right. Yeah, we're good. So so anyway, when I did, you know, I got top of the show. Yeah, 3,500 for the, for the week, 5,000. I don't remember, but there was no negotiating more. And it wasn't just because it was prestigious what the networks paid they figured out that they would pay the lead more money but when people guest shot on the show they would make any money and so i just came in at the tail end of that when when guest stars were broke and our, our leads were broke the guy who did whispering uh suicide over this because you know you're on a contract like for example i was offered a contract from universal I would have been one of the last and you get 30,000 a year for seven years. But if you make $2 million selling Pepsi, that money goes to universal and you get 30,000 a year. So by the oh, time wow. 76, they were turning those jobs down. They were not taking that contract. So when I did Seinfeld, um, I got whatever I got, but now the supporting people like the one who played uh, Jerry's wife with whom I was going to date um, she asked for a lot more money and they just passed. I mean, I would have taken the five grand or whatever the hell it was, but she was getting not very much money for doing that show. And but but the plan was to do, like, you were going to be hard. written in to do 10 more? Yeah, okay, wow. Well, yeah, listen, that... I was very annoyed by that. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, we've heard from we, a few guest stars that that might have happened a couple of times. We could have used you know, we could have used a little more Sid Farkas for sure. It really would have worked, and I certainly uh, when uh, Larry David was on sixty minutes two years ago, he showed my episode for which I got a nice residual check. I'm happy to tell <laughs> that it was one of the ten best episodes of the series. Was it the Sniff and Account? Do you remember or the second one? The doorman. No, no, it was the second one. The doorman. The doorman. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, the, the it's up there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, it feels was personal for him, you know. Of course, yeah, it's about his. Uh, thing. And he sold, he sold brassiers, you know. And he saw, well, listen, and uh, like you said, he saw something in you to know you could play that role, which you know, obviously, is better. Than your I character. think that is one of the real kind. You know, people say, "Well, what, uh, what are you proud of in your work?" And uh, one of them was Larry loved what I did on Seinfeld, and and he was not an easy man, you know that. Curb your enthusiasm is the real Larry David. I mean that, right, right. and uh, he not and Stephen Bochco loved my work. Uh, I had to get an agent to override a casting director on Hill Street Blues, and uh, oh, it says my bandwidth is low. Uh, that's all right. Well, listen, Patrick. Not only did those guys love your work, but I think. We love your work. Seinfeld fans across the country love your work. And this has been such a treat. Iconic. Um, Iconic. I think, I think what, you, what you taught us today is, to your point, just be good to people. And listen, barring any unfortunate incident, we plan a lot. All right. Thank you guys very much. And love to all the Seinfeld people out there. And thank you. Thank it's you, a great this show. Is this is a treat. Thanks, Pat. Thank you, Pat. This Thank was so great. So much fun. Both. Enjoy. Good. Have a great Let's night. do it again sometime. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%, Patrick.
barring any unforeseen incidents. <laughs>